Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Dr. Jonas Kaplan. He's the very first person I interviewed on the Nature and Nurture podcast. And here, over two years later, and over 100 episodes later, we're back at it again. Jonas is a cognitive neuroscientist and research professor at USC's Brain and Creativity Institute, where he co-directs the Dornzeif Cognitive Neuroimaging Center. His research focuses on consciousness, the self, belief, empathy, social relationships, action perception, and creativity. Jonas, welcome back to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thank you for having you back, Adam. I can't believe it has been two years, and I'm so happy that this has grown for you and that you're still doing it. Me too. I've learned a lot. I was a clueless undergrad when it started, and you were mm. like a faculty advisor. This started off branching from Omega Psi, the Cognitive Science Club. And then when this went online, we had guest speakers such as yourself and talking about research. And anyway, it started to seem more podcast-like. And that's the story of how this grew out of that. So right. I wanted to ask you if you're familiar with Mark Solm's work. Oh, a little bit. He's like a psychoanalyst, right? Yeah. And he's like a hybrid between Antonio Damasio and Carl Friston. I know Damasio and then Friston's work, I, do. I don't think we've talked about, but are you familiar with his more recent stuff on active inference, this predictive processing theory of consciousness? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that I think about a lot and something that Antonio and I were just talking about yesterday, actually, because we have a lot of thoughts about that. And I don't know where you'd like to start, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And then I'll model my questions based on that. I think that the active inference idea and the whole sort of predictive processing movement in neuroscience, it's very intuitively appealing. It's, I feel like when it comes to perception and the consciousness of perception and higher level cognition, it's probably got a lot of truth to it. Although it's a difficult thing to actually prove and provide evidence for. And that means that it's amenable to um, overreach. And I feel like it, it has become a little bit like one of these neuroscience fads where everyone tries to explain absolutely everything in terms of active inference or predictive processing. And there, there are people that think that this is now the thing that the brain does. And I think that's a little bit too much. In, in particular, one of, the, one of the things that Antonio and I were just talking about was the relevance of active inference to interoception. So we know with exteroception, let's say you're perceiving something visually, I think there are a lot of ways to convince yourself that your conscious perception is more of a top-down phenomenon than, than a bottom-up phenomenon. You've got all these illusions where you might see a patch of a light that, that you're convinced is darker than another patch, but it's really just because of some inference your brain is making about shadows. When it comes to internal processing, there have been a lot of people that have applied the active inference paradigm to interoception, how we feel from our own bodies. And this is obviously an important question for us because we're interested in emotion here. And there's a, just a tremendous amount of the nervous system that is inwardly focused. And these are the oldest parts of the ner nervous system. And people like Anil Stas, who I had a really nice conversation with on my podcast, actually. I was interested in hearing from him. My podcast is called Float. I did a podcast with a filmmaker, Mary Sweeney. And he's tried to extend the active inference framework to in interoception. And this is where I start to become more skeptical, partly because it is even harder to show that you have these same kind of illusions you have in vision, but also because these systems are so old that it's hard to imagine them having the necessary computational juice to be able to pull off something like prediction. And they're also very slow, unmyelinated fibers that make direct contact with the internal milieu, the actual chemical environment that they're sensing. And so I just don't know if predicting processing makes, makes as much sense in that context, but that was a long rant. It, it seems like people talk about predictive processing at many layers of analysis and they're meaning different things, but you're using the same language. So one type of prediction is the more cognitive type that I think we're alluding to here, where it's like you're perceiving the world and you're getting incomplete sense data and you're filling in the blanks and you can look at a lot of cool optical illusions of how your brain does that filling in the blank in this very Bayesian way. And then when you're talking about more bottom up cognitive or even affective processing, like interoception, like you're talking about, I guess the 
active inference theory there is that it's still a form of predictive processing, but it doesn't seem to be conscious in the way that we normally think about prediction. They're talking about minimizing free energy or minimizing entropy or minimizing prediction error, which I guess are more computational terms that you don't necessarily need conscious awareness of to describe. No, I don't think there's anything about the computational framework that would require consciousness. I think it just happens to be the case that a lot of our extra set of consciousness does come from this kind of inference and from knowledge that we bring to the table in hypothesis testing and active inference. But yeah, it doesn't need to be that way. When it comes to interoception, consciousness is fuzzier because we certainly can be conscious of our internal bodies. You can feel your heart beating in your chest. You can feel butterflies in your stomach when you're about to do a podcast. But those things can also go on completely outside of our awareness, right? You don't mm -hmm. need to pay attention to your breath or your heartbeat and they, they can flip back and forth or get in, in and out of conscious awareness. And so, yeah, I don't think there's some kind of necessary link between predictive processing and consciousness. So this is where Mark Solms comes in. You're right. He's a psychoanalyst. He's also a neuropsychologist. He's been studying brain damage for decades. And his early research was on the study of dreams. So he was one of the people who found in the 80s, 90s, that when you have brain damage, let's say to your visual cortex, it impacts your dreams. So you normally would have visual dreams. And then if you experience this type of brain damage, suddenly your dreams are more like listening to a podcast. Or conversely, if you have damage to language centers of the brain, it impacts your dreams where like now they're only visual and you're no longer talking in your dreams. So that was pretty cool. And then he was influenced by Antonio Damasio's work as well with the idea that consciousness is like fundamentally rooted in affect and that these more ancient brain regions that govern emotion, well, are more ancient than the type of cognitive predictions we're talking about. So he wrote this book, The Hidden Spring, talking about the hidden spring being basically very ancient brainstem areas being the source of consciousness. And he's combining Antonio's work and with Carl Friston's theory of active inference, basically saying that what consciousness is doing, it's minimizing prediction error, but not just in this cortical way that we're normally talking about consciously. Like prediction error goes all the way down to basic affect. So the theory is that we experience higher entropy as inherently negative and lower entropy or better predictions as inherently positive and that consciousness is grounded on the on like the formal computational side in this theory of active inference and then on the subjective side of like where we get emotions from the idea that emotions are representing those computations and they're more basic than cognitive awareness so you get that's why you get something like this unconscious classical conditioning that you can instill in animals, even in very simple animals, or more like operant conditioning. Like even in, in very simple animals like planaria, flatworms, they can learn to associate something like a shock with a light stimulus. And the idea is it's clearly not conscious prediction in the cognitive sense that, but there's something affective prediction wise going on there. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. Is classical conditioning necessarily involving a predictive process? I have to think about that. It certainly seems to in the sense that you can anticipate something you're conditioned to experience, like a shock or something like that. But I don't know if it has to be done that way. I have to think about that a little bit more. So he talks a lot about looking at this in Bayesian terms, where you're gathering new data and then that's informing your priors and you update your predictive beliefs and you get a posterior. And then I think one of the ideas here is that not only do you have priors that are informed by experience, but some priors are just genetically pre-programmed. So that would be something like an innate fear that you could have. Yeah. When it comes to feelings and, and the consciousness of them and what sort of neural machinery you need to have those kinds of things. The way we think about it is that one of the first steps is that you need some kind of a mapping process where you're representing 
some kind of a space, whether it's an internal space or an external space. So like when it comes to the body, you've got some kind of internal map of the body. Now it's very vague maybe, and not very spatially detailed where your stomach is and you have information from it. And these maps are basically representing the state of that thing, like your stomach. And in that sense, they don't need to anticipate what's there. Yes, you want to get information from what's happening in your stomach, but can you, and do you anticipate it? I think is an open question. I don't know that it has to be done that way. As, as attractive as the idea of minimizing prediction error is, I, I don't know if these entire maps are actually anticipated by the brainstem or by the insula or where, wherever it's doing it. We should talk about the idea of dualism that exists in neuroscience or psychology today. So I, you can talk about from the philosophical side, dualism going way back to Descartes. And he says, I think, therefore I am. And he has this idea of the mind as this sort of immaterial soul that maybe exists outside of the brain and body. And then that's all disproven when neuroscience starts becoming a thing and we house consciousness in the mind. But there, I've heard some more recent criticisms that like there's still an implicit dualism in that because people tend to associate mind with brain, but not necessarily with the rest of the body. and and maybe you've been involved in this as well, has been doing more recent research on like how the entire body influences emotion and consciousness, right? Like even bacteria in your gut. That's right. The mind arises from the interaction between the brain and the body and its surroundings as well. And so there's a, there is a sense in which it is hard to extricate from that. So many of the feelings that we have require that you actually have a body. Remember the, there was a Netflix series some time ago. What was it called? Altered Carbon, where you had this little, your consciousness was like in a disc that they could remove from the back of your head and put into a new body if you needed to. And there was like, once your consciousness was put into your new body, the guy would take a few minutes to like, just get used to where the arms were and then you'd be totally fine after that. That got me thinking about what would it actually, this sort of brain transplant experiment what would it, how much work would it take for a brain to get used to a new body? It's a completely different chemical, hormonal, structural environment to be in. Antonio thinks that you can't actually have consciousness without a body. I don't, I disagree with him there. I feel like if the brain grows up with a body, you can remove it from the body and it's still going to be conscious, partly because of, you mentioned the work from Mark, Mark Solms and the way that dreaming works. We know that imagination uses the same machinery as perception and that we can be conscious of imagined experiences of the body and of the world without those things actually being there. And so I feel like the brain could actually be conscious in a vat without a body, mm -hmm. but certainly in everyday life, so much of what we experience is actually from our bodies. And so it, it is a little bit strange to locate the mind only within the brain or even stranger, only within the cerebral cortex as some people. Is Antonio here talking about a literal physical body or is he talking more abstractly about something like a Markov blanket or something like just limitations that define boundaries of the system, but that could be instantiated computationally? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. And we pressed him on this. And because we've been very interested in artificial consciousness and we've written some about, about this lately, we just had a paper a couple of weeks ago in science robotics about what is required to have empathy in an artificial system. And there we made the argument that empathy, since it's rooted in feelings, requires some kind of actual body at some stage of development. It doesn't have to be a real body necessarily. It could be a simulated body some kind of artificial system. And it doesn't need to always have a body, but it needs to have had something like a simulated or real body at some stage in development or develop these feelings. That's the position that we laid out. And that's a bit of the stretch of what Antonio thinks himself personally, but we were able to agree upon that. It's interesting how in media, how different the predictions are from what's turning out to be the hard stuff versus the easy stuff. So I'm thinking about Star mm -hmm. Wars, where you have droids that can fully move around on the battlefield, but they have terrible aim. And it's like <laughs> getting the robot to have very precise aim 
is one of the first things we figured out and we're still trying to work on how to give robots embodied uh, ability to move around and navigate an uncertain environment. It is really interesting to watch the stages and the path that the artificial intelligence is taking and how it grows. And you're right. I don't think we would have predicted how it went. One of the most interesting things about the whole large language model situation to me is just how they present in chat GBT, how it presents with this certain niche of quasi intelligent behavior that can, can somehow fits so well into our consciousness detection mechanism that it's very easy for us to attribute all kinds of things to it that it doesn't actually have because those things haven't developed in the path of artificial intelligence yet. It's, it seems so smart until it does something that isn't that smart. That's like right. I've asked it to do yeah. lit reviews. Go ahead. That's to do lit reviews and it comes up with like fake. It'll come up with fake citations. Yeah. Yes. The thing is, that's true. And look, they, there's obvious, you can point to things about these models that are clearly deficient and different from human intelligence. But, but part of the thing I think people forget in these conversations is that people are pretty dumb too, right? They talk to a person, they make shit up all the time. We make inferences and we fill in gaps. And there's something about our own language models that are not quite as smart as we think they are that makes them closer to these artificial ones, I think. Yeah, I've been playing around with ChatGPT with poetry recently, and I found it's really good at writing poetry and analyzing mm. poetry. Like I, wow. I've written some poems and if I give it to friends, like, I don't know, many people don't appreciate it or appreciate subtle things, but it's very good at capturing like some subtle illusions. If I ask it to, if I say, mm -hmm. pay particular attention to the use of capitalization and it. I'm, I'm assuming it's because it's the statistical learning thing. It's able to pick up on those subtle deviations from what like normal English grammar would be in ways that people generally aren't paying attention to unless you're like an expert in this stuff. But then if you're trying to have it do scientific writing, especially after years and years of training and research, then it just seems like it's failing to live up to the whole linear logical flow. Like you can tell when it makes right. a mistake or when it makes up a citation, but creative things it seems to do way better at that is interesting yeah it probably is something about the creative process at least when it comes to like divergent thinking that having a huge network of ideas which is what it is would be really good at the thing that we were writing about in our paper in science robotic was really about the in, in some sense about the deficiencies of these models because they while they can appear to express empathy for you, and if you tell it you're having a bad day or whatever, chat GPT can console you. And they're, they can become very good at understanding, responding to, predicting our emotions. And so they seem like they are being empathic. But imagine you met a person who was really good at that stuff. Then you find out that this person actually doesn't feel anything themselves. What would you think of that person? Basically like a sociopath, right? The person's really good at manipulating us and figuring out how to respond in social situations, but really has no, no motivation itself coming from its own feeling. It's actually mm -hmm. quite a dangerous situation. On the other hand, if you have an artificial system that can feel, and we can get into whether or not that's possible, but just assume, stipulate for a moment that it is possible for an artificial system to feel, and it develops its own empathy through a bottom-up process rather than some kind of set of rules that we give it in this way that's similar to us. You learn that, you learn what pain is. You learn that something hurts when you touch a stove. And then when I see you touch the stove, I can have some kind of resonant feeling. I know what it feels like to hurt and I can see that you're hurting. And so I want to alleviate that for you. I have some weighting of your own, of other people's feelings and my own concern and my own sense of value. Value really comes from this having a physical vulnerability that you have to take care of. If you could imbue our artificial system with that kind of vulnerability so that it could really feel and understand what pain was, and it wasn't limited in the same way that our brains are computationally, we only have a certain amount of attention that we can spend. But if you've got a huge artificial system that, that has unlimited computational power, you could actually develop a super empath 
some kind of an artificial Buddha, basically, that could help us manage these really complex human problems that have to do with being compassionate and figuring out how to live together. You ever listen to Jordan Peterson's Bible lecture series? I think I've seen, I've heard little bits of it on YouTube. So this is something he got a lot of flack for from both sides because there are Christians who are saying you shouldn't be analyzing the Bible from an evolutionary psychology perspective. And then most psychologists and neuroscientists just aren't going to take that seriously, anything having to do with religion, period. But I found it very interesting. So he's taking this evolutionary psychology approach combined with a Jungian approach as well. What are certain archetypal themes emerging in these stories and how did they evolve and what purpose are they serving? And in one of the first ones on the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis, he analyzes the idea of eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's what gives you consciousness. You realize that you're naked. He interprets that as realizing you're naked means essentially gaining awareness of your own vulnerability in this way that you seem to be describing. And consciousness, mm -hmm. he interprets as you become aware of the future. So most animals in a somewhat unconscious way are just living and dying. And you could say like, even if you're storing food for the winter, is that something you're cognitively planning or is it just instinct? But at least with humans, we know we consciously plan for the future and we can think far enough into the future to think about our own mortality, which is again, realizing our nakedness and realizing that we die. So he interprets all of that as the punishment for eating the fruit is that you become mortal. It's not necessarily like you were immortal before and now you die. It's more like the knowledge of good and evil makes you realize that you've actually been dying. Yes, the knowledge of good and evil is the consciousness of value that, that some things are good and other things are bad. And that, that's that the, the, one of the initial splits of consciousness that divides the world up from the unitary Garden of Eden situation that it would be in otherwise. I, I think Joseph Campbell had a similar interpretation of that story, and it's really cool. I'm really interested in those kind of archetypal stories and how they themselves impact our consciousness. Story is another aspect of being conscious. Part of you're saying that Jordan Peterson interprets the, the knowledge of good and evil is also pertaining to the knowledge of the future. I would say it's just leaving the present moment and leaving the eternal present and having a knowledge of past, present, and future in general. It's another one of those splits that there is a time I don't just exist. You know, now I can imagine future events, but I can also remember past events. And this is another important axis of our consciousness. And that axis is really dominated by story itself. When we think about who we were 10 minutes ago or two years ago or a hundred years ago, and we think about who we're going to be, what we're really doing is constructing some kind of a narrative. And our narrative is this structure that the brain has for organizing events that unfold over time, in which there are characters and obstacles and events that stitch together to form some kind of a meaning. And because of, because this is such an important aspect of consciousness, we've become more focused on it in our own research. And it was one of the things that I really like to do in the coming years is to understand better systems of the brain that interpret story. You might remember years ago, I was obsessed with the idea of panpsychism, which, and I was looking at it from this evolutionary perspective of, if you go way back, like, it's not like there's any single cutoff point at which you go from no consciousness to consciousness. So I was thinking maybe it's just a more simple explanation to say consciousness is pervasive throughout the universe. And it's just that it's a matter of more or less. And maybe it's something like a physical property that all matter is endowed with. And you have a bare minimum unit of consciousness and a single particle up to very complex systems like ourselves. And that wouldn't exclude the possibility of even more complex consciousness that we just haven't discovered yet. And I wouldn't identify as a panpsychist anymore. And I think it's after right. being what happened. <laughs> it was definitely largely influenced by Friston's theory, by this active inference model. I think the purity of that argument is still right, but it's still it's functionally useless if you don't have something like a system that's stable over time. Because as you're saying, what if consciousness is information processing, there needs to be some sort of viable way 
of doing that across past, present, and future. Otherwise, mm. it's not really a system. It's just a blip. And then I started getting into philosophy of mind about ideas about the stream of consciousness. I don't remember who coined that term, but the idea that yes, you need... William James. Oh, yeah? That's cool. I've been working in William James building <laughs> oh, nice. in the psych department here. And sorry, I lost my stream of consciousness. Oh, I'm sorry. I... The idea, yeah, is that if it's not a self-organizing system that sustains itself over time, like mathematically, maybe in principle, you could define this as a conscious system. And if you believe in something like a panpsychist integrated information theory, you could quantify an amount of information that's in that system. But anything that isn't a self-sustaining system like it would only exist as you define it, whereas self-sustaining systems and the only self-sustaining systems we really know of are life in that they're anti-entropic, not in the final sense, but in the sense of like they're consuming energy from outside the system to withstand entropic decay of the system right. itself. Like that seems to be stable enough across time that you can not only use this sort of panpsychist informationist account on it, but it can actually engage in active inference to maintain its form. So that's how all of this has been piecing together in my mind over the last couple of years. Well, okay, let me dig into that a little bit. So one thing that, a couple of things that I feel like responding to, one is the argument that you made for panpsychism, and maybe this doesn't hold a lot of weight for you anymore, but I guess I don't quite follow it because you were saying how there was no point at which consciousness was there, wasn't there, and then was there, that there wasn't mm -hmm. like a binary switch. But binary category boundaries aren't necessary for something to arise. It, the fact that for example, human beings, there was no point at which human beings just suddenly appeared. It was a gradual thing. It doesn't mean that we were always human, right? It's not like we have to believe in panhumanism because of that. Things can, things can certainly develop it and slowly come into being. So I guess I don't get that argument for panpsychism. And then the second thing is that I'm interested in what you think is, first of all, I'm interested in what you think about information, integrated information theory in general, but you seem to be linking in integrated information theory with panpsychism. Mm -hmm. but I guess I, I'm curious about that because to me, it also seems if a certain, I don't necessarily subscribe to the IIT, but if you do, some configuration of matter that has the right information integration would be conscious, but that wouldn't make it a fundamental property of the universe. It would be a property of things that are organized that way. So this could all be my interpretation or misinterpretation, maybe not built into the IT theory itself. The way I interpreted that was that any system of matter can be quantified as carrying a certain amount of information. And this would apply even at the level of a single particle. So there would be like some bare minimum packet of information that you could use to describe is the quark up or down spin right now. And then from there, the complexity can grow. And the idea is that as it grows, it's not only like it grows with as a function of how many particles there are in the system, like linearly, there would be some sort of combinatorics that goes because there's like a whole combinatorial explosion of how the different particles can interact. So then the idea of why the human brain has more information or more consciousness than a giant building, even though the building has more matter, is just because the building is relatively static and within the brain, information is being exchanged all the time. But the reason that I viewed it as panpsychism is because that would say that all matter carries information and all systems of matter transmit information, like e even objects that look static from our perspective, like down at the particle level, are changing all the time rapidly. It's just change that we filter out as noise. So the idea there is that everything, if, again, if consciousness, you define a priori as information processing, then everything would be conscious. It's just that most things that really aren't alive aren't dynamic enough to be interesting. I see what you're getting at. I see how that could technically be considered panpsychism, but it also seems to me like maybe not to have the, it doesn't have the, the, the gist, the original gist of panpsychism, because you could still have some 
if this is a continuous property of let's say psi or whatever it is, a phi or psi, the, the IIT parameter that represents information integration. I mean, maybe one particle has some information states that the psi could basically be zero for that particle because it's not integrating information, even though it has some kind of informational state. And then it can, this parameter could grow as states become more complex. You could still say that these phenomena that are at the very low end of the information integration spectrum are just not conscious because they don't have sufficient information in integration for us mm -hmm. to consider it. Whether that is a chair or a person in a coma, they're not exhibiting the threshold level of information integration to reach consciousness. I think at a deep level, this is all related to postmodernism. I'm going to use the pan-humanism oh, thing. Oh, no. <laughs> you gave us a, as an example. Because I do think, you I mean, it's right. You can look at life and say species don't really exist. Species are sort of these conceptual categories that humans created to overlay on top of what is really just a continuous process. And the extreme of that could say nothing really exists. It's a Zen idea. Nothing exists. And the universe is just this continuous sea of matter and that you only get categorical distinctions once you get consciousness, which I think is an once interesting Once you leave argument. the Garden of Eden. Yeah, exactly. What do you think of that? I think both are true. I think that it is that and there's a sense in which distinctions are a property of minds and not a property of the universe itself, which, you know, and any kind of consciousness I have of myself as a separate being and the boundaries of my body have to do with my perceptual systems and where it's convenient for me to make those kinds of distinctions. There's molecular exchange happening between my shoulder and the air around it. And I, that's what this, this glow coming from behind the brain is supposed to represent that kind of unified. I, I like the Alan Watts had a great way of saying this. He talked about the sun and where the boundaries of the sun are. And this really is the thing that, that sort of struck home for me because so you could think about the sun as that yellow thing in the sky and the boundaries of it are where the yellow ends, where the brightness of the sun ends, that sort of ball of whatever it is, I guess it's not fire, but some kind of nuclear fusion that's happening that we see rendered in movies all the time. And that's the sun. But that just is a distinction based on the light. The sun's also giving off heat, obviously, which you can't really see. And... We are, by that definition, if you think of the sun as the boundaries of where the heat of, of the sun is, then we are actually within it because we feel the heat of the sun, right? So there is definitely a sense in which these distinctions between anything is a mental phenomenon. Now that said, that doesn't make me a postmodernist because I do think that what, when you're in the world of language and distinctions and concepts, there are some concepts that work and some concepts that don't work. And there are concepts that fit with reality and concepts that don't fit with reality. And there are concepts that better describe the kinds of distinctions that, that we perceive and worse describe the, the kinds that we perceive. So I think consciousness, for example, as a concept, yes, it, it's a useful concept to us insofar as it describes certain phenomena in the world that are distinct from other phenomena in the world. It has to be a distinction. Partly why I don't like that. Like it completely dilutes the concept of consciousness to being essentially meaningless because it doesn't, if it's everything, then it's nothing. If it's everything, then it's nothing. Exactly. And so what is it useful for us to call conscious and what is it useful for us not to call conscious is I think part of what the conversation is about. There are two forking paths I want to go down here. I think it'll be useful to go down both, but one will definitely turn into a tangent. So I'll just place the signpost now and you can pick. Okay. So one has to do with what you alluded to about in narrative, you get some interpretations or some values that are more fundamental than others. And maybe you can take an evolutionary approach to explaining that. So this would be that sort of archetypal idea, the Joseph Campbell idea we were talking about earlier. So that's one sort of antidote to postmodernism. And then the second one is a more statistical way of looking at it. So if you're talking about mm -hmm. how do we define the sun, it's this Markov blanket idea that you see in Friston's work about like statistically, even if the boundaries of the sun aren't really set, there's going to be a general sort of confidence interval where most of the information is captured. And then beyond that, 
it's like diminishing returns. So you could expand it as far as the earth. And yes, the sun's heat is still reaching us. So we could make that the boundary. But it's if you get 99.9% of the information with a much, much smaller radius, you might as well do that. And then I guess there's a third path here too, which is like philosophy of science, where you're taking a continuous process, often some statistics, and then you have to place a somewhat arbitrary cutoff on it, like a p-value threshold, at mm -hmm. which point you're saying, this is what counts as good enough to reduce it down to a binary of true or false. Yeah. And our perceptual systems are doing something like that. That second concept you described about the kind of statistical approach to where the boundaries would be and how they're diminishing returns after a while, that's probably exactly why we use light as a good index of where the boundaries of things are, because it gives us that 99% confidence interval. We don't really care about whether or not the wall over there is solid in some kind of philosophical sense. It isn't, right? It's mostly empty space because the, if you just look at it sort of a microscopic level, each particular atom is mostly empty space. But the fact that I won't go through it is what's relevant to me. And so the boundary there, my, my brain draws that it, it, where the, where the light bounces off it. It's a really, this useful way of doing it. And I know that sounds like I'm moving toward pragmatism, but it's not necessarily just that there, there is a, there is an actual truth of the matter to where that wall is and where it isn't. Right. What was the first thing you said about first thing had to do uh, with archetypes archetype. or the idea yeah. may, maybe you could even do it, frame it in this sort of statistical sense or this information theory sense of some beliefs. Maybe you're thinking about a hierarchy of prediction, like some beliefs are going to be more fundamental and allow you are just more useful. So then the question, is it fundamentally just pragmatism or is there something deeper there? Maybe like an evolutionary truth, like a collective unconscious of functionally useful ideas that are eternals. Yeah, eternals or universals that just ar arise out of the sort of good inferences about the patterns of life. I think that's what stories basically are. And there are some that are better than others. I, for, this is where I disagree with Jordan Peterson, because I think the Bible stories as a collective whole are pretty bad roadmaps to, to the world and how to live a modern life. At least, you know, there. And then, even within the Bible, there's a hierarchy there. So he's primarily True. analyzing older stories, like in Genesis, and those are passed down from like Mesopotamian mythology. So that if you're talking about the ones that are clearly more laden within a historical context, that seems to be less useful. But it seems like maybe in mythology, the deeper you go into history, the more useful they are. At least the more similar they become across cultures. The more potentially similar they are, yeah, because they're abstracting across what changes over time. But I don't know, life has changed so fundamentally that even the deeper ones, I think you got to question them at least. This idea of archetypes, though, is really interesting. And it's something that we're, we're going to be looking at. The, we have some idea of some of the neural systems that are involved in piecing the other stories and understanding the world through story. Like, for example, the default mode network seems to be do something that that's relevant is involved when we know lights up when people read stories we know that it responds to longer event structures than say perceptual cortex does that responds to very rapidly changing events the default mode ever can integrate across big chunks of time and respond to things like scenes and movies that have meaning instead of little tiny particles of uh, a frame of film for example but we still don't know how that works computationally. And one of the ways into that is we're going to be looking at a student who's going to be doing a project on, on tropes, which are like archetypes in that these repeated themes or event structures that happen in TV and movies that we become culturally familiarized with. And we'll be looking at, are there, does the default mode network respond in a similar way to similar tropes, even when they're implemented through different characters or different scenes and very different mm -hmm. perceptual information. Is it all cortical or is it possible there are some more ancient like limbic brain regions that are responding to something like narrative, but in just more of a emotional way, devoid of context. So across stories, even if it was just a stick figure type thing, you could imagine the amygdala just 
looking at danger run. And that's the whole story. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Absolutely. When I focus on the default mode network, it does not, it's only cortical. That's the only system involved. In fact, I think of it more like a puppeteer that's pulling strings of other brain regions. We know the hippocampus is involved, for example, it's very important. And probably a whole bunch of subcortical structures or older cortical structures like the insula that are able to imagine feelings from the body. But a lot of it does have to do with pulling away from the present and transporting yourself to times and places that are disengaged from your current perceptual experience. So there's this, there's this cool study from an anthropologist who looked at hunter-gatherer societies in, in Africa, in the Kalahari, and they live in a way where during the day, there's a lot of business to do. And what she did was she analyzed the kinds of talk and language that they express throughout the cycle of the day. And during the day, is it Holly Weissner, I think was her name? Throughout the day, most of the content of the discussion has to do with the here and now. What do we do with this particular animal or this guy's being a jerk? What, how do we deal with that? And dealing with the business of life. At night, this is a situation where there's no like electric light that keeps the work going throughout the night. Everyone's sitting around the fire and something like 80% of the language turns to story, to talk of other times and places. Part of that is just because the here and now literally disappears. You can't perceptually see anything more than a few feet away from you. You can't do the work that you were doing. And so you're just sitting there in front of the flickering fire with the group of people telling a story, just very much like what we do in a movie theater nowadays with the flickering lights in front of us. But so I think this idea of removing yourself from the present, going to different times and places is very deep within human history. And we know that the default mode network is one of these strange systems that seems to be doing more, the less we are engaged with the things that are right in front of us. Have you heard of Jeffrey Miller's mating mind hypothesis? No. Jeffrey Miller is an evolutionary psychologist. He wrote a book a while back called The Mating Mind. And it's a theory about sexual selection being the primary cause for runaway brain growth. So yeah, he's arguing that it's not only survival needs that explain why we got so intelligent so quickly, and it's not only a direct result of having more energy from hunting and from cooking and all these things. Like Certainly that contributed, but his argument is that sexual selection is makes the most sense in terms of explaining what a selection pressure would be that can lead to such rapid brain growth above and beyond survival necessity, given that our earlier ancestors who are less intelligent seem to survive for millions of years with that level of brain size and chimps still survive with that level of brain size. And then he also speculates that creativity and storytelling could have played into this. So the idea that knowing that once you do all of your hunting and foraging and meet your survival needs for the day. You're sitting around the campfire socializing. And the idea that the people who are more intelligent and more creative with their stories, that can be a way of gaining status or attracting mates. That's a really neat idea. What, why do we have different selection pressure than chimpanzees do sexually? I think the idea is that sometimes in sexual selection, you just get these runaway feedback loops where Whatever triggers it is arbitrary, but then once it starts being selected for, it, there's just this Fisherian runaway process. And right. it could be the case that one of the things that I'm actually going too far down this rabbit hole because I was more sold on the idea that walking upright is what led to the selection pressure, like both in terms of we save energy because walking upright is more efficient and it shifts our hunting strategy. I did a class with David Reichlin at USC. He's in the biological anthropology department mm -hmm. on this. So that sold me more on, we got big brains as a result of bipedalism, but I did like the mating mind a lot. It got me thinking. No, about I like that too. I mean, and there's so many, sexual selection is, it just produces so many strange, complicated behaviors. Think of all the different ritualistic things that birds mm -hmm. do attract each other or strange. I just saw a peacock a couple of weeks ago. I was thinking about this. Yeah. It's just so bizarre. Yeah. I learned about sexual selection 
pretty late into my education. I'm surprised it's not talked about as often because you learn about natural selection and you learn about evolution for things that are adaptive. But then if you ask about a peacock's tail, it's like a hindrance in every single way you can imagine. It costs energy to grow. It makes you more visible to predators. Predators. It makes it hinders mobility. And you would think that it would be selected out very quickly. So it wasn't until I learned about this handicap idea in sexual selection that sometimes evolution will select for something that's actually maladaptive to survival just as a costly indicator or reliable indicator of saying, look how badass my genes are that I can have this massive handicap and still can overcome produce. That's pretty cool. But the idea about creativity being a indicator of sexual value is really interesting. Certainly, if you have ever been a musician, <laughs> do you play any music? My mom's a piano teacher, no little bit of piano. Ah, interesting. If you've ever been on stage performing as a musician, you, you can feel this effect because it just suddenly increases your social value in a way that's very strange. Oh, you think so? Have you experienced that during talks? Yeah, yeah, there's that as well. There, there's something probably just to the fact that like any anytime you are the center of social attention, it increases your social value. People perceive, it's like a contagious thing. People perceive, if they think if other people are interested in you, they should be interested in you. The way Hollywood works as well. Get that up here. This is something that I learned from Jordan Peterson. I don't know if it's his idea originally, but he's talking about status and dominance and how our serotonin system keeps track of that and how this is highly evolutionary conserved. So there's this lobster meme for him because he talks about in one of the chapters of his books how lobsters ha use the same serotonin system as us. So when they fight, the winner lobster will get a serotonin boost and he'll puff up and like flex. And then the loser lobster will be all sulky. But then if you give Aww. the loser lobster antidepressants, SSRIs, then it'll flex as if it had just won the fight. So the idea nice. there is that whatever our serotonin system is doing, it's hundreds of millions of years old and it's tracking dominance. And we see this in our ape relatives that they're highly hierarchical in terms of status. And then he's arguing that what's unique about humans is that it's not just that there's one dominance hierarchy and you're on top of it or not. There's so much divergence in terms of our ability that you can be like a skinny nerd loser and bottom of the athletic hierarchy, but then you can rise to the top of the academic hierarchy or the artistic hierarchy, or you can mm. conversely be at the top of the athletic hierarchy, but then be like failing in school. And the idea is that if you're thinking about it from a sexual selection perspective, these are all different niches that we can inhabit at and climb to the top of and attract mates within those different niches. It's so complicated, right? Especially in, in, in modern life where you have the, I was just thinking a little bit about the concept of reputation recently, which is related to exactly what you're saying, that people have these mental maps of a social hierarchy. Actually, we're doing an fMRI study on this now, how people perceive the social status of different social groups in society and what the neural systems are that map these things out. But as you say, we can have multiple different positions because we have several different isolated reputations, which makes it very difficult to maintain. Like online right now, you can have personas, different niches of your life. I have like my scientific self that we're interacting with right now, but I exist as a different person with a slightly different name in the music world or in the world of my neighborhood or in my building or wherever it is. And you have to constantly update your, your models of who you are in these different worlds and who you are to different people. It's very confusing. And there's this theory of mind that doesn't seem to kick on until pretty late in development where it's, wait, my teacher has a life outside of school. Exactly. Yes. That's why it's so strange when you encounter your teacher in a different context. Yeah, that's right. How does this connect to your research on the self? So the self is this constant thing, but then clearly we are, even if you want to take more of a psychoanalytic approach, psychoanalysts believe that we're not necessarily a unified self, but a collection of competing sub-personalities. 
Yeah, so there's no, this is one of those things where there's no ground truth to the narrative self. There is to be, there is more to your physical self in the here and now. But once you get into the ideas that your brain is constructing about yourself, they don't need to be unified. And I think there's a question about whether the degree to which they're unified relates to your mental health. For example, is it healthier to have just one coherent self that always is the same in, in all circumstances versus maintaining all of these different competing versions of yourself that have very different presentations and, and values. I think that's probably true. There's probably some advantage to being a whole. That's what the idea of wholesomeness comes from. But I think modern life is just so complicated that the way we interact with it pulls these different selves out of us. It's really interesting how a situation can create a, how you respond to an environment can create a different version of yourself just in the moment. I, I've often thought about this with, it's like when you walk through the security line at the airport and because the whole situation is designed to find something you might be doing that is suspicious, part of you feels like you're doing something wrong. Like, you're like am I a terrorist? I, I feel... Feel like I might be hiding something and you start just imagining yourself that way. And you can see how just like any little situation like that can pull a different version of yourself out, which is really interesting. Do you think really, that's um, an evolutionary remnant? Like we evolved living in small societies. So if you're yeah. going through TSA check and in reality, it's a stranger doing their job, but your brain is picking up on it as if, as if this is one of my hundred people, small town and they're treating me with suspicion, therefore I must be suspicious. That's right. There's no way that that we could be evolutionarily equipped to, to deal with these incredible billion people societies that we are now interacting with and that have all of these strangers interacting with us all the time. Yeah, I think it is definitely something that we are figuring out and probably has a lot to do with why there there is so much. We have a, we do have a, a something of a crisis of mental health right now, at least in America. My, my wife is a therapist. She works at a counseling center and a university. And I just, because of that, get a lot of information on the sort of mental health status of the undergraduate population. And I know it's very difficult right now for a lot of people. And I think this really is a challenge of, of synthesizing this narrative self with the complexities of the way that the world is working right now. There's something about it that hasn't quite settled down into a steady state for us yet. Yeah, Robert Sapolsky talks about this in terms of social stress and social comparison. He did decades of work with baboons. And I remember this one liner from a lecture. He's baboons are a great model species for social stress because they only need to hunt and forage for four hours a day to maintain all of their caloric needs. So that gives them 12 hours a day to socialize and make each other miserable. And then yeah. he says that humans are pretty similar in that regard, but unique in that we live in these super complex societies and we can abstract. So he's, you're, not, you're doing social comparison, not just within your troop and not even just like on TV or social media, you're looking at someone. It can be something as simple as he says, someone in a Lamborghini drives by you. You don't even see their face. But Lamborghini, you abstract as higher status than me, and then it makes you feel inferior. And then Jonathan Haidt has written a lot about this recently as well, about how social media is uniquely bad for that type of social comparison against people who aren't even in like your little hierarchy of comparison. Not, even, not only that, they might not even be real because you have Photoshop and all this other stuff. Yeah, it's in basically just the whole social media system just abs just completely exaggerates that ability we have to make each other miserable. And to, it's really interesting in that way too, because you can see this kind of self-creation impulse that, that people have online, like really expressing itself to, to, to a degree that you maybe didn't see without social media. But people are exaggerating all of those things that are cues to their social value. And when you see these exaggerated aspects of other people's social value, it does make you feel inferior. Even something as simple as one of the things I value is a sense of humor. And 
you go online to a place like Reddit and you read a thread about whatever it is and guarantee the top comment is going to be something that is totally hilarious. And yeah, I uh-huh. should have thought of that. But it's curated from millions, mil- thousands, thousands of things that people said and then upvoted the very top ones. And so you're seeing sort of the pinnacle of, of this kind of thought and then comparing your own thought to it. It's very misleading. Yeah, there, there seems to be a similar status selection or sexual selection type thing going on when you have that sort of crowdsourcing of wisdom or of humor. And you could say it has nothing to do with sex. It's really just who people like interacting with. But I, I feel like I veer maybe a little too far on the side of from an evolutionary perspective, everything boils down to sex. So even if it's money or status, why do we value that beyond basic survival? Like indirectly, it's yeah. probably going to help you procure a mate. I think it did for me. I think my wife <laughs> likes me partly because she thought I was funny. And that was one of the things I was able to do because I'm not particularly just strong or I don't have a high testosterone level to express some of the more traditional sexual characteristics, but I was able to do those things and also be creative. It certainly worked for me. Like all the different niches that you can climb between that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, exactly. Do you ever feel tempted to edit your own photos? Let's say you have a big pimple and there's that blemish tool or you whiten your own teeth a little bit. The thing is, I'm so physically attractive that it just doesn't, it's not necessary for me, but but I can understand why other people would want to. Yeah. Us lay people, I think there's a temptation to do that. And maybe there's a generational effect as well. I think people my own age, like in the social media age are more likely to do that. And I experience a very interesting set of conflicting emotions when this happens. So for one thing, it's like you see a photo of yourself. It's a real photo, so you shouldn't really judge it harshly, but it's like you know that especially if it's something like a pimple that's literally a tap away to just and then you're using all these sorts of rationalizations of normally I don't have acne like that so if right, anything right, it would be right. more representative of me I know there's social psych research on this as well like sometimes students who let's say they didn't study or didn't do the reading or didn't do their homework they'll lie but then they'll rationalize their lie by saying but I'm the type of student who normally does the reading and I just didn't do it this one night. So therefore lying in this case is actually indexing the normal type of quality student that I am. Yeah. I think there's some truth to that. What you're trying to present is like an idealized version of your own face or of yourself or the way you conceive of it. So looking at yourself is so strange. And like we're doing right now with Zoom, it's bizarre that we see ourselves while we're talking because normally you don't. And because you don't, you are only thinking about when you imagine what your own face is, you're not imagining a pimple on it. You're imagining the sort of canonical version of your face that you can create from the idea of it. It's the same thing with hearing your own voice. It's always weird to hear your own voice. And there you also have this like distortion effect of the different ways in which you hear it. We did mm-hmm. some imaging experiment on self-face recognition and self-voice recognition back in the early 2000s. And yeah, you know, there are some special things that happen when you see yourself a strange thing. That we, speaking of evolution, it's probably only in the last, what, like 50 years that we've been able to see these live, without a mirror, a mm-hmm. live version of yourself in such high definition that you're staring at while you talk to someone else. It's very strange. That is very strange. Another thing that happens with these social media filter temptations is that on one hand, the better you make yourself look, there's something that's flattering or status boosting about it because you get to see this idealized version of yourself actualized. But then you also might experience something like an internal imposter syndrome, knowing that the more manipulation it takes, the less real it actually is. So that can make you feel bad about yourself. And then again, there could be a rationalization, but everyone is doing it. So I might as well post the more idealized version of myself. So that's what a lot of young people are going through. And it again, no wonder mental health rates are not great right now. No, exactly. That's right. That's that is just a whole new layer of anxiety laid on top of life that I that we frankly shouldn't have to deal with. Yeah, that's that's a very negative cycle to be in. That's why I try not to post pictures of myself online. That's interesting. Interesting you bring this up in this way because just yes just yesterday I was thinking I, I needed a picture of myself for something, some website that I was doing. And I don't like pictures of myself for this very reason. But I thought maybe what I should do is create like a cartoon. I'd be happier with an actual 
instead of touching myself up, like photoshopping my face mm-hmm. or whatever, having a, the other way that you can idealize somebody is to like draw like a picture that, that gives like a cartoonized version. And I started to work with some of the artificial intelligence image generators to try to generate a drawing of my own face. Mm-hmm. And it was really weird. And I, I couldn't get it to work to my own satisfaction. Probably just the tools I was using were like mixing my face with some percentage of someone else's face. All kinds uh-huh. of strange stuff happened. Yes, surprisingly, I think phone apps are better. I don't remember what it was, but I've definitely played around with an app that was able to make a cartoon version of my face or really of any image that you give it. Because I, I don't know if you're talking about something like Dolly, which is more similar to chat GPT. And... Yeah, it was something more like that. So it wasn't a phone app. I should look into this. Yeah. Oh, have you seen any of the data from dating apps like Tinder? A little bit. What are you thinking of? There's two main findings. So one is just in general, especially in adults, like older adults, that the ratio of likes is Pareto distributed, just like income. So it's like top 10% of the users are getting 90% of the likes. There's a massive sex difference there too. Two thirds of Tinder users are male. So that already puts a bunch of competition. But then not only that, but if you're looking at it from, again, more of this evolutionary sexual selection perspective, like women tend to be choosier and less interested in just hookups and men tend to be more interested in just hookups. So if you're thinking about already, there's a baseline ratio of two to one. But then if you think about only the users who just want hookups, it's probably even more skewed male to female. So there's even more competition. Oh, boy. Yeah. I'm just glad that I don't have to live through this myself. So absolutely awful. So that's the backdrop. And then with David Schwartz at USC, I was involved in this research a couple of years ago. We were looking during the pandemic, how is this actually impacting college students' mental health? So of the people we surveyed, more than half of them who were single were on these dating apps. And if you ask most people, I think there's been other research on this as well, like most young people are meeting people to date online. It just doesn't happen that organically anymore. And then if it does happen organically, it's through something organic where you're bound to meet anyway, like through mutual friends or through class. It's much rarer that you see anything like you'd see in TV or movies back in the day of a stranger just approaches a stranger and hits on them. I think people my age, especially after COVID, are very shy and maybe even stranger averse. Like the expectation is that you need a reason to be talking to someone if you don't know them and you wouldn't just do it of, hey, how's your day going? Yeah, I know. I, it, it is also weird that we think of that as the status quo, though, and partly because there's so much like TV and movies where people, a guy will just walk up to a woman in a bar and introduce himself or hit on her. That's really hard to do and really is not the way that people have met for all of human history. That only happened for a brief period of time, really, for hundreds of thousands of years before that, it was much more arranged through family relationships and ma- matchmaking and, and things like that. So the idea that you're just supposed to like spontaneously bump into a person in your life that you will then fall in love with and have this like long lasting relationship is probably a, a peculiar phase of human history that just didn't last very long. So I haven't kept up with most of the research since I graduated last year, but some of the findings I remember from working with David on this Tinder data set was that a minority of men say they're hyper satisfied with it, but most men, their mental health declined from fall semester to spring semester being on the apps. And at a good amount of those, like part of it is just attrition, but part of it is you get fed up with the app and part of it is you meet a partner and then you're no longer on the apps. Mm -hmm. And that's a minority of students as well. And they're satisfied with it. But again, not many people are actually from fall to spring meeting someone. And then in spring, they're still in that relationship and they look back and reflect on their dating app experience and say, this was actually good for me. And then for women- So is it it just like more more opportunities to- interact with women that the apps provide are really just providing more opportunities for frustration. Yeah, more opportunities to get rejected. If you, if you, in order to talk about this, you need to quantify something like what your 
mate value is, and that can be controversial. It's not just physical attractiveness, which is something you could quantify, yeah. even in terms of just how many likes are you getting, but it would be really everything. Like how funny is your bio or how likable do you seem based on your photos or may maybe you list your school and your major and things like that can be signals of attractiveness. So somehow the idea is that maybe when people are evaluating these profiles, if you do it or when I do it and when I watch people do it, like we're pretty quick with our judgments. So this would be a cool study. Like you're looking at the profile, you're shown their first photo and you swipe right. If you like them, you swipe left if you don't. And generally you do that within a matter of seconds. And sometimes someone's just so attractive and you swipe right immediately. Other times you're not interested immediately and you swipe left immediately. And then it's, it only seems to be when it's borderline that you're like, I need to gather more information and keep looking through the rest right. of the profile. I noticed that women seem to be more intentional about it. Like even from the first mm. photo, they seem to go through the whole profile to screen out for red flags before swiping. Whereas my male friends seem to just pretty immediately go based on the first photo and then shoot their shot. That's a fascinating data source. And these profiles are basically like the new peacock feathers. Exactly. To create some kind of a, a strange signal profile for people to respond to. Is there a difference? I wonder, there, I know there are multiple apps and I don't know how they differ from each other, but I just wonder if there are ways that you can set up the mode of interaction the way these algorithms work so that they're better or worse, like more frustrating or less frustrating. Yeah, so there are three main apps that I know people are using. So Tinder has historically been the biggest one, although now it's more seen as just an app for hookups. And then Bumble is one that's a lot like Tinder, but the woman has to message first. So this was, I think it was actually the CEO used to be an executive at Tinder or used to work at Tinder and then was frustrated by the amount of harassment that a lot of women would get. Because a lot of the messages, the first message you get is just sexually explicit. And there are dozens of guys doing that. So Bumble yeah. is pretty similar, but the woman has to message first. Mm -hmm. And then another one is Hinge, which is similar to both of those, except it's more relationship oriented. So the idea is people who are just looking up for hookups aren't going to be on that app. And you have to like mm -hmm. answer prompts and the bio is more holistic rather than just picture focused. And do you think something like that is less damaging to mental health? I think it's potentially less damaging and maybe on average less damaging. But again, when you're thinking about this in terms of some proportion of the users are going to get what they want, which is meet someone interesting who likes them and happily ever after, and then other people are going to get rejection. I imagine that if you're in the rejection group, when it's on Tinder, it's, oh, they just looked at me for two seconds and swiped and they're only judging me based on this one photo. So oh, like you God. can rationalize it. But then for Hinge, like if you put much more time and effort into a profile and you know that people are seeing this sort of holistic picture of you, maybe the rejection right. would hurt more there. It's me that they're rejecting, not just some like random picture of it. That's interesting. Oh, wow. But maybe yeah. we could connect this back to this idea of narrative. So. One, one theme I've seen, I don't remember if this was Joseph Campbell himself or just in a similar sphere, but you see something like a Beauty and the Beast narrative across romance novels. So there's, and I've heard evolutionary takes on this, of there's something very sexy to women about you have this dominant, untamed, beastly man, but then he lets out his soft side just for this one particular woman. Yeah, exactly. Those, those, those tropes, that's an example of a, of a good trope there that then probably shows up over and over again, because it has some kind of satisfaction to the people listening to it. And I guess that is a story that's directed at women. I've never been interested in that particular story mm -hmm. myself. I don't even know very much about it, but I, I have a, it reminds me, I have a beauty of the beast story that, mm -hmm. that, that ties into another aspect of our research. And that is this idea of narrative transportation, that when you're hearing, when you're listening to a story, how you can get drawn into it and involved to the point where you are experiencing the story fully, you forget about the here and now, and you're just fully in it. It's going to happen when you're reading a book. It could happen when you're watching a movie. 
And it's something that differs from person to person. Some people more easily fall into these narrative worlds and other people are more grounded in their present reality and it's harder to pull them away. And my Beauty and Beast story is an example of an extreme, somebody at one of the extremes of, of this continuum here, and that, that's my mother. She was watching a performance of the Beauty and the Beast, the play on Broadway. And there's some point in the story where I guess the beast is looking towards the audience and the villain has a knife and is like coming up from the beast to kill the beast from behind and just lurches up on the beast. And in the middle of the theater, my mother is like in the way back of the theater at the balcony. And as soon as this villain like creeps up on the beast, apparently in the middle of the theater, she shouts, watch out. And from her perspective, she's watching this story unfold. And then all of a sudden the entire theater is just looking at her and she has no idea why. And she was so involved in this story that it was really happening to her. And she's like screaming to the characters that he's a, he's a real person. And we really have the, and this is, she's an extreme obviously, but we really had the ability to get into these characters and treat them as real. And I think it is because they are a kind of practice for real life and a rehearsal for things we either expect to happen or want to happen. There are some really cool individual differences questions you could ask there, because one, one perspective might be that someone like your mom, who's immersed enough to actually want to shout out as if she's there, is the one who's more immersed. And other people might feel that they're immersed, and therefore they're quiet, and they think that the ones who are talking about the film are less immersed. And I could see arguments for both sides, like, in a theater, I don't talk. But if I'm watching a movie at home with someone, I do making comments on it. And I feel like that can add to the immersion because you're commenting on this shared experience. Like, what do you think is going to happen? But have you ever talked to one of the characters? In a movie? <laughs> I don't think yeah, that's a higher level of immersion. You also bring up another aspect of the story experience that we're really interested in, which is the, the social aspects of being in an audience and what that brings to the experience. It really is always a part of it. Nowadays, we can watch things alone, but traditionally that isn't the way that it works. And this is, an, this is a question we're interested in, both because it can help to uncover some of the social aspects of story experience. Like you said, talking about it and making comments about it is part of the experience. It's fun to go to a movie with someone else because you can, after you walk out, you can process it together and understand it. And there's almost like a, you have this compulsion until you want to talk about it with other people. I saw this movie a couple nights ago. It's called, it's on Netflix. It's called The Ritual Killer. You have to see it. Okay. And I'll add it to my list. I haven't heard of this. Okay. It is absolutely awful. So it's not that it's good, but I want people to see this so that I can talk about it with them because this is a unique experience of experiencing something just so uniquely awful that even when it's bad, you just have this desire to tell everybody else to watch this so you can talk about it with them, this connected experience. We're currently investing in some equipment that will allow us to study some of the things that are happening in the brain when people experience things together in audiences versus watching them alone. So for example, the kinds of synchrony that brains have with each other, when you're all together, watching something physically together, your bodies are interacting, you can hear each other versus you're watching the same thing, but in separate rooms, for example. USC is a great place to be doing that with BCI and with the film school. So I'd like to hear more about your podcast because that's at the intersection between those as well. Yeah, it is. This podcast came out of a relationship that I have with a professor in the film school. Her name is Mary Sweeney. And Mary is a film editor, a very successful film editor. She edited many of David Lynch's films back in the 90s and 2000s, like Mulholland Drive and Blast Highway and all of those things, some of the early stuff. And she developed this course at USC called Dreams, the Brain and Storytelling which is like such a cool name for a course. And uh, every year I give a lecture in there to the film students about the brain to try to just talk about some of the things about the brain that are relevant to film. And we, after talking to each other for 10 years, we just developed this understanding of how, that what filmmakers do uh, in both in making films and in thinking about films and analyzing them is very similar to what neuroscientists do. They are trying to understand the human experience and having conversations very much like the one 
that you and I are having right now and trying to express something about it, to portray it. And both of those processes involve understanding how cognition and perception and empathy and emotion work. And so we just, that was one aspect of it. And then the other aspect of it is that, so that's how film is very much involves aspects of a sort of science, but there's also aspects of science that people don't quite appreciate that are very much similar to a creative process like filmmaking. There's a creative aspect to making science where you have to be solving problems to create an experiment and reading up exactly how you want it to go and having some kind of inspiration that you carry through the process. And so the processes of science and filmmaking, we found some parallels there as well. And so we decided to do this podcast where we would talk to both filmmakers and other creative people. We had some musicians and some other artists on there and also talk to neuroscientists as well and try to find the common themes in the way they work and the things they do. And it was really fun. It was really interesting and definitely reinforced this initial idea we had that there's just so much in common between the two fields. Do you know George Alvarez? He's a neuroscientist who studies vision here at Harvard. No. He's teaching a course this semester called Neuroscience Fiction, which sounds like it's delving into the same themes. He might be someone you'd be interested in interviewing. Yeah, I love it. My favorite neuroscience fiction film is Altered States. Ever seen that? No, I haven't. Altered States is William Hurt, and he plays a neuroscientist who becomes very interested in his own experience and his own origins. Oh, man, you would actually like this movie. Watch this one instead of Virtual Kill. This one's actually <laughs> okay. Good altered states and he experiments with a sensory deprivation tank and he's got like ET and stuff while he's doing it and then he goes to Mexico and finds these psilocybin mushrooms and does those in the tank and then it goes in a direction that I won't spoil. Oh interesting. Is altered yeah. carbon a reference or spin-off to that in any way? No, it's not. Totally different. Do you ever talk about Black Mirror on your show? Uh, we did. It came up a couple times. I, I love Black Mirror, and that's a perfect example of the way in which science fiction can do some of the similar work in exploring the human condition that neuroscience can do. It's it's really cool. I, I'm thinking of the one where you have this memory implant that's recording all of your memories, and you can play it back yeah. on the TV. And then that's interesting and scary to think about for a few reasons. Like for one thing, he's in, in the context of the show, he's neurotically going over and over to look at cues for his girlfriend cheating on him. But then thinking of that and how fallible human memory is in general, I don't know if it would make it better or worse. I see arguments for both sides because th there would be lower rates of something like false witnesses in court. But do you, th do you think it would be a net positive or net negative impact on society? It's a really good question. There's the impact on society and then there's like the impact on you as an individual. I think forgetting is important and there's a reason that the brain forgets. It's not just because it's not good enough at remembering. We have active forgetting processes in the brain that intentionally try to minimize the uh, salience of certain older memories. For example, I'd park my car in the same parking structure every day, and but not always in the same spot. And so I have to, when I go back out to my car today, I have to remember where I parked it today. And that involves forgetting where I parked it the previous 100 times, making sure that those, those memories are not as salient to me. And I remember there's a book by the neuropsychologist, Alex, what was his first name, Alexander? Luria, a Russian neuropsychologist. And he wrote this book called The Mind of the Demonist, that is a, a memory specialist. And is a case study of this man who had this condition, it's basically an eidetic memory, but he effectively could not forget information. So Luria would do these tests where he would write a grid of numbers, like a hundred numbers on a chalkboard. And he interviewed this guy over the course of 30 years. And 30 years later, he could say, on, on July 1st, I wrote these numbers on the chalkboard. The guy would just read them off like he was looking at it. It's an incredible thing. And he even tried to make a living doing this. but. <laughs> He was incredibly unhappy and he was basically haunted by all of these memories and wanted to be able to forget because you have a negative memory, for example, this is something that, that, that happens with PTSD where 
maybe a memory sticks in you and it's that the, the actual re-experiencing of the memory is causing you suffering and you don't want to be able to remember it, remember it anymore. He had experiences like this with basically his whole life and did all kinds of things to try to forget various pieces of information and wasn't able to do it. That book really drove home to me the value of forgetting. And so I do think people think of memory as weak because it goes away, but there is a value in that. Is this related to nostalgia bias? Oh, wow. That's interesting. We have a student right now, Sarah Hennessy, who is studying this nostalgia for songs. And there's this, this bump, this nostalgia bump where we tend to remember music from a certain period of our life. I think it's like age 10 to 18 or something like that, maybe a little bit longer that people remember it really well because there's a sort of a, a, an emotional impact and also probably because those songs are part of your self-creation at a time when your autobiography is, is a choose your own adventure novel and it could go a lot of different ways and that some of the formative chapters are being written. And so there are some special things that happen with memories around that time that, that make them more nostalgic for us. I've but, heard uh, yeah, so. nature nurture style debates about this, about whether adolescence is a particularly salient timeline for anything neurodevelopmental reasons, or if it's just a matter of within our culture, this is a time of rapid change where you gain more autonomy. And especially if you're moving for college, you're moving across the country and it's a whole set of new experiences. So then a way to test that, I guess, would be if you had someone who was in the same environment from like birth to 30, and then at 30, you moved across the country and had a whole bunch of new experiences. Would that like 30 to 35 age range would be more salient than your teens and 20s? Yeah. Has that work been done? Do you know? I don't Maybe know. With that extreme, but like across cultures where there are different traditions in terms of when people move out of the house. I don't know. It, it probably has been. So that would be cool to look into. Absolutely. It's probably, it's probably some probably combination probably, of both. Some got yeah. to be some combination of both. Yeah. There's one last big topic I want to ask you about. So this relates to the earlier discussion about evolutionary perspectives on different world religions and archetypes in some of Joseph Campbell's work and maybe connecting it to your work with Sam Harris. So. One thing I learned from Peterson's biblical lecture series is that you see cross-culturally this sort of evolution from polytheism to, even if not overtly to monotheism, that the gods seem to collapse into bigger gods over time. So the idea is er early on, maybe in mythology, you get sort of there's a god of everything. And over time, they start to take on multiple names and multiple different attributes. So if you're thinking of big polytheistic mythologies that many people are familiar with, like Greek mythology, gods like Poseidon, he's the god of the sea and of earthquakes and of horses, and he has a few different names. And the idea is that perhaps a long time before that, those were all separate gods and they just got absorbed into Poseidon. And then what he's arguing is happening in this Middle Eastern region that eventually grows into Judaism is that you have a polytheistic pantheon of gods and eventually they converge towards monotheism. He talks about Mesopotamian gods and he talks about Egyptian gods. And in Egypt, you see the same thing. And oftentimes he's arguing, that, or I think originally it was maybe Carl Jung or Joseph Campbell or someone in that similar space who argued this, that first there's just a whole pantheon of gods, and then they start to form more of an explicit hierarchy. So you get like Zeus or Osiris at the top. And then over time, at least, if it's a culture that grows towards monotheism, that king god eventually takes on all the attributes and just becomes the highest god. And he is taking this as a psychological transformation. Carl Jung wrote a lot about this, about it being reflective of a transformation of consciousness of like, so it's a transformation that happens within humans and then we project it onto our mythology. So it's like, we realize that it's not just that there's a God of rage and a God of lust, and they're all possessing us, 
and we say that when I'm angry or when I'm lustful, this God is inhabiting me. It's more there's only one meta consciousness and there's a piece of this within me and my different emotions or states of being are all manifestations of that one spark of divinity. So he's talking about this all very abstractly, symbolically, mm -hmm. but I found it pretty convincing. And what that seems to suggest then is that in this evolutionary psychology take, you might see some adaptive value for like a conception of God, even just from a purely symbolic biological perspective. If you have value preferences, then the abstracted extremes of those are something like good and evil. And there's something like a highest possible good or a highest possible mode of being. And that would be something like God. And then there's the antithesis of that, which would be something like Satan. And you could see this emerging cross-culturally. So then the, basically the question is, he had a big debate with that with Sam Harris. And I think Peterson was arguing that these are like archetypal realities and the fact that we see them cross-culturally and that they have this evolutionary adaptiveness means that they're real in some like natural law-like sense. And then Sam was arguing like, they're not that useful and we don't need them. They're remnants of our past. Yeah, that's, that, well, first of all, it's a fa fascinating idea about the convergence of all the different gods into the sort of monotheism and what that trend actually means. I think of it more like a, a you mentioned it as a possibly having an evolutionary psychology, evolutionary psychology consequence, but I think of this more as this is the software evolution of the mind, not the hardware. And it's a cultural evolution. And so it is something that happens a lot faster. And it doesn't necessarily have the same pressures on it. It has a different set of collection pressures because it's like a, almost like a mimetic evolution, right? Instead of a genetic one. And it reminds me a little bit of the Julian James concept. Are you familiar with that theory? No. Oh, gosh, you're going to this one. He, he wrote this book in the seventies, Julian James called the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. And the idea was that at some point in human history, basically up until the time of about ancient Greece, that we interpreted the voice in our heads as coming from the external world, from gods, basically. And he analyzed all of these old Greek and Roman texts, like the Odyssey and the Iliad, and he showed it was very painstaking scholarly work. It was pretty impressive. It's a bizarre theory, but it's just impressive mm -hmm. amount of work he did to show how the language that people used up until a this certain point in history seemed like they weren't referring to their own thoughts. They would say, Zeus directed me to go to Crete or something like that. And then at some point it started to shift where they would actually refer to their own internal thoughts. Oh, I decided, or I thought that I should do this. And he saw this as a kind of internalization of the gods speaking to us. And he had this mechanistic view of that it had to do with the right and the left hemisphere finding a way to communicate with each other, that the left hemisphere, we know from the split brain case that the left hemisphere has this kind of like narrative impulse that it's always confabulating and talking and generating the stories and language about stuff. And he thought that at some point, the two hemispheres, this is what he called the breakdown of the bicameral and two chambered mind, that they were isolated more in a software sense and something broke through where they started to communicate with each other with, without involving this attribution to the outside. And we internalized or attributed the, the speech to something internally instead. So it was a big software shift that happened at this one moment in, in history that he thought there was evidence for it in the language. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but those kinds of changes would remind me of the kind that you're talking about here with the mm -hmm. change in, in attribution of the different spiritual forces of the world to different entities and then maybe to a single entity. Now, coming to the question of whether these conceptions are still useful or not, I tend to think that they're more misleading than useful at this point in history because they there's something about the polytheistic 
point of view that I like better than the monotheistic point of view, because it seems like it's easier to take it in a mythological sense. Like the idea of Poseidon or Neptune being like the force of the sea. Yeah, the ocean does have its own power to it. I can see conceptualizing that or personifying it as Zeus. What Once you collapse it to one single God, it's like the personification of that, it's easier to confuse it for an actual, the reification of what, like the whole universe. It's easier to misattribute that to being an actual natural reality or a thing. And I think people do that quite a bit. And it's possibly where some of the confusion of of religion has come in, where people stopped treating it as a personification and took it more as there's really an entity, which is this God that's separate from the thing itself that it's representing. To me, that's like the ultimate confusion of religion there. And since we have now, of course, obviously better explanations for the forces of the sea, I don't know that we need Neptune anymore. And I certainly think that the monotheistic God is more of a confusion than anything else. You know, the philosopher Spinoza? Yeah, sure. He had this idea of God as nature. And in a way, he was a panpsychist too, because he had this idea of mind and matter being like different attributes of the same fundamental substance. And he believed that substance was God. And like, we are all part of God. And he viewed it as this entire universe, cosmos psyche, or this very pantheist thing. But so that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is God as the set of all natural laws. So like a very mm-hmm. abstract scientific God. And I've thought a lot about that. So it's like a Platonist view. A lot of mathematicians believe that math isn't something that's invented, it's discovered. And the Platonic form of all mathematical reality is just out there and we can discover it and tap into it. And I've been thinking about that in terms of natural law and potentially even moral law with this idea of archetypal truths. If if something like that exists, then it could be that over time as we evolve, whether it's through natural selection or cultural selection, we begin to discover some of those truths that are reflective about our own behavior. Even in population dynamics or like in game theory, you see this because you get convergence towards specific adaptive patterns, right? Like tit for tat is a very basic example of that. And I was wondering, is that a useful or tenable definition of God? Very abstract, but still monotheist in the sense that it would be like a single equation of everything. I guess in a way... That's a better definition or potentially more useful one than the God as nature, because we're full circle of the conversation here when we're talking about panpsychism. And I was saying that I thought consciousness, the concept of consciousness was diluted if you apply it to everything. And if it's everything, it's nothing. And that's the, that's the problem with the God concept. If it's everything, it's nothing. And, it, and but it's hard for us to think of nothing. And so when we call it a word for it, then we do reify it. It becomes like a thing and it's a thing that is no thing. And then that's why I think it's confusing. So I think your second suggestion of something like the set of laws or the structure within which the universe has to happen is probably a potentially more useful concept because it describes something that can be distinguished from something else. There are laws that don't exist. But I still think that the word God and the concept has so much baggage to it that it connects with mm-hmm. so many other ideas for us that maybe that isn't the best way to go. You're right here. You sound more like Sam and I sound more like Jordan. So this is pretty much exactly <laughs> how their debate went. And it seemed like they were in pretty much complete agreements about what this about more or less scientific determinism and how consciousness arises in the brain, right? But then it's more a matter of how do we interpret this and what's the language we use? And Jordan seems to use more of this traditional religious language. And Sam is, no, we need to ditch all that. It carries too much baggage. Very so much baggage. And also with Jordan Peterson specifically, it seems tied to Christianity. Mm-hmm. And that is a particular set of concepts that has a whole bunch of a whole bunch of flotsam and jetsam there that we probably do really need to get rid of. And I just don't know how much baby there is to save there from the bathwater. I prefer to just get rid of it all and start fresh. Have you heard of this Nietzschean idea that Christianity 
died at, at its own hands in the sense of people had to systematize their thinking in order to see, okay, what of it, what of this new scientific worldview that we're discovering is consistent or non-consistent with the Bible? And there was like this heavy elevation of truth, which itself is like a proto-scientific method. And then of course, once you get that value of truth and logical consistent consistency within a single framework, like it dies at its own hands. It dies at its own hand. I do agree with that. I'm here at a university, a place of of knowledge and some of the first universities were founded by Christians and they developed these places of learning, which then ultimately took apart their, their concept, but maybe that's not what they intended, but that's actually in, in some sense is what they intended, which was to find the truth. And so if, if the truth is involves a destruction of some previous paradigm, that isn't just good. That's a good thing. So even though science is completely evidence-based, do you believe that it's a faith-based process in the sense that you believe some natural truth is out there, like this mathematical Platonism? I don't know why you would call that faith. No, I don't think it's a faith-based process. I think you, you believe something provisionally, not by devotion to it, and your beliefs should always be subject to change, regardless of what they are. Or how about the beliefs of the scientific method themselves? There are certain axioms that it seems like you need to accept to even undergo the scientific method. So one would be something like, there is such a thing as objective truth. Another would be that we necessitate this sort of logical consistency. A can't be not A at the same time. And you get these whole, like the base logic that grounds your thinking. And then another one, it's not really an is-based claim, but it's an ought-based claim, which are famously separate. And it's something like, and this is a worthwhile endeavor that knowledge has some sort of inherent value. Like all of those to me, maybe you don't want to use the word faith, but axiomatic in the sense that science itself can't prove them. It's more like things that you accept in order to do science to begin with. Maybe there are such things. I, I don't know if those things that you just laid out are the things. For example, you could find evidence that knowledge is not good. And that does help us. And there are probably areas in which we found that like we don't necessarily want to know what all the possible viruses are that can kill the humanity uh -huh. in one. You know, so there, there are areas of knowledge where science isn't necessarily recommended and that we shouldn't just go into because it doesn't seem like the right thing to do. So some of those things are amenable to evidence, but also I think there's a difference between accepting an axiom as an axiom when you know you're doing that as a means to an end and being willing to accept a different set of axioms for a different set of ends. But that's not faith. Faith is actually a, an unwavering devotion to those axioms for, uh -huh. for a reason other than some kind of feeling, I guess. That, that makes sense to me. I like both of those criticisms. Although the axiom one, it seems like even hidden behind that, there's maybe something like an axiom that you're willing to displace other axioms <laughs> with better evidence. And then implicit in that is something like there's such a thing as evidence that can be better or worse. And it's like, there, there must be some sort of implicit value system in that, which is, yeah, how, where does that come from? Value ultimately comes from the structure of life. Again, the biggest full circle. I mean, uh -huh. there, there are things that are actually objectively good for our ability to thrive. And there are things that don't help us thrive. And that's where our sense of value is rooted and like basically everything comes out of that. We are living life from a biased position. If we don't take care of our own, our own physical existence, if we don't fight the fight against entropy, then we can't do any of this other stuff. And so that is like a basic axiom in a sense, and a, and a value that just comes out of the fact that we're alive. That's a great full circle place to close. Yeah. This was a blast. Thank you very much for your time, Jonas. Absolutely, Adam. Anytime. I love talking with you and it's so much fun. And uh, I feel it has been a couple of years, but I can tell that you're, you've been feeding your mind and it's growing. So that's great to see.